change of oxygenated blood. And guess where that blood vessel dementia comes from? Those little tiny arteries are clogging up from that steady stream of fat, cholesterol, etc. It's really quite clear from the standpoint of cancer and the standpoint of cardiovascular disease that animal protein plays an enormous role. Is chicken better? It's a question of whether you want to be shot or hung. The flesh food that I would eliminate from the American diet would be poultry, would be turkey and chicken. A brilliant advertising campaign has convinced people that, oh, it's white meat, it's healthier. The leading source of sodium in the American diet for adult is chicken. It can be labeled all natural chicken, but be injected with the salt water, I think up to 800 milligrams of sodium. Heterocyclic amines are clear-cut carcinogens, and they can form in any kind of meat as it's heated, as it's cooked but by far the biggest source is chicken. We sent researchers into fast food and family restaurants. Not only were there carcinogens in every single restaurant, but we found them in every single chicken sample that we took. If somebody brings their family in and they're buying a bucket of chicken, nobody tells them that there are carcinogens. If you're selling carcinogens to people, you've got to warn them that they're in there. But the American Cancer Society encourages people to switch from red and processed meat to chicken. Why would the American Cancer Society tell people to switch from eating one carcinogenic food to another when a Harvard University study showed that men with prostate cancer who eat large amounts of chicken increase their risk of the disease progressing four times? The number one dietary source in America of cholesterol is chicken because of the volume of chicken. You know, chicken's become grilled chicken and organic chicken. It's, it's machismo, but it has nearly as much cholesterol per gram as red beef. So just on sheer volume, it's the number one source. Yeah, eggs being close behind. I never really thought about eggs much. I just thought of them as a standard part of a healthy diet. But then I found a study suggesting that eating just one egg a day can be as bad as smoking five cigarettes per day for life expectancy. The yolk of a hen's egg is the most concentrated glom of saturated fat and cholesterol. It is made to run a baby chicken for 21 days with no outside energy. It is pure fat and cholesterol. And when we put that into our bloodstream, it coats our red blood cells. Our blood gets thicker and more viscous. It changes our hormone levels. It raises our cholesterol levels. There's nothing healthy about eating the yolk of the egg. But I thought cholesterol and saturated fat wasn't an issue anymore. You know, these saturated fat studies that have come out trying to vindicate saturated fat? There's a campaign by the dairy industry, right? Number one source of saturated fat is dairy. It's not meat. 2008, the global dairy industry got together at a meeting and explicitly, you read their agenda, was to neutralize the negative impact of milk fat by regulators and medical professionals, unquote. So what did they do? They funded studies. The main study that started the whole saturated fat media craze was funded by the National Dairy Council. The egg industry similarly funds studies that confuse consumers by making claims that eggs don't negatively affect heart function. That is, only when compared to eating a McDonald's sausage McMuffin? So what they're really saying is that eating eggs is just as bad as eating a McMuffin. When you eat foods like beef or steak or a processed meat, a hot dog, you're not just getting saturated fat. You're also getting other additional toxins that are in that food. There's heme iron, carcinogens, processing chemicals. This is all a lot more complicated than just looking at saturated fat. You know, the strategy is not on making their products any safer. The strategy is to just try to confuse the public, to introduce doubt. You know, there's a famous tobacco industry memo. It's called, Doubt is Our Product. That's all they had to do. They didn't have to convince Americans that smoking was healthy. They just had to introduce doubt. Then they would win. If there's just enough controversy, people kind of throw up their hands, I don't know what to eat. Confusion is their game. I really don't think people thought what they ate led to heart disease. They think, oh, it's genetic, my parents had it. And I don't think people really think that what they ate led to diabetes. I think, oh, my parents had it, I was gonna get it. And certainly cancer, they don't think that way. People have bad lifestyles that they've inherited environmentally. They've been exposed to a certain way of eating and living that they've carried on into their adulthood, passed on to their children. That is why they go on to develop the same diseases that their parents and grandparents may have had before them. But it is not inevitable. Even if you have a genetic predisposition, doesn't mean it's going to necessarily manifest. And what determines whether it manifests or not, maybe those epigenetic variables, the things that you can control, the environmental factors, the dietary factors, the lifestyle factors. And we can actually change the expression of genes, tumor suppressing genes, tumor activating genes, by what we eat, what we put into our body. So, you know, even if you've been dealt a bad genetic deck, you can still reshuffle it with diet. 
I had always thought that I would develop heart disease at a young age because both my dad and grandpa had heart attacks. I was taught that they were genetic, but their heart attacks probably had less to do with genes and more to do with their diets high in meat. That's why when I went on the American Heart Association's Heart Healthy Recipes page, I could not believe they had an entire section on beef recipes. This was just like the American Cancer Society encouraging eating group one carcinogens on their site. Meatloaf, pork loin, steak on your recipe list? Are you kidding me? It's like this menu is trying to give people heart attacks. At your website, we noticed heart healthy recipes and we were uh, kind of bewildered by why there's a bunch of recipes on a whole section on beef, beef recipes, and there's also a section on egg recipes when there's such a strong link between beef, red meat, and heart disease. I, I, I honestly don't know because I don't do that, I guess. That's not what I do. <laughs> Another organization rep that wasn't able to answer my questions, but he said that he'd have someone get in touch shortly. I was, however, able to talk to the president of the American College of Cardiology, Dr. Kim Williams. Well, the American College of Cardiology is a 47,000 member and growing uh, organization with a dedicated mission to reduce heart disease and to improve patients' lives. And if you look at the incidence of hypertension and diabetes uh, and mortality in men, they, they actually get reduced as you uh, go higher and higher in, in terms of how much you restrict animal products. What about fish? So fish is a little different. You've got the four worries, which is PCBs, mercury, um, uh, saturated fat, and cholesterol. And the cholesterol is all over the place. You can hit tuna in water, that'll be almost less than a glass of milk, to salmon or tilapia, which is higher than a pork chop. If you look objectively at fish, what you find is they've become essentially mercury sponges. And that's why in many parts of the country they warn you, you know, don't have more than so many of these fish a week because it's getting too much mercury can kill you. Fish are eaten by bigger fish who are eaten by bigger fish and these pesticides and herbicides bioaccumulate in the fish flesh and these big fish, including the salmon, which people think is the healthiest fish. Truth is the amount of pesticides and herbicides in the flesh of these fish are shocking and they have estrogenic and cancer promoting properties in them. They'll say, well, but don't sardines have less concentration of toxic waste product than other ones? Something being less toxic doesn't make it healthy. It just makes it less toxic. Farmed fish is by no means healthier. All the antibiotics that these animals have to be fed, similar to chickens and turkeys kept in confinement, these fish get infections. They get fungal infections, they get bacterial infections. You've got to feed them antifungals, antibiotics, and these substances accumulate in the fish flesh as well. I always knew that pollution was bad for our health, but I had never thought about the environmental pollutants affecting food. Dioxins being the most toxic man-made chemicals known to science cause all sorts of things. They cause endometriosis, they cause cancers, they cause endocrine disruption problems. Most of your exposure, 93% of it, comes from eating meat and dairy products because it climbs up in the food chain so effectively. So you can get exposed to living near these incinerators and breathing it, but it'll take you 14 years to breathe in as much dioxin as a cow will ingest by eating the grass in one day. And that dioxin will accumulate in its fat, which includes the milk and the meat, and anyone eating meat or dairy products is going to get that dose of dioxin, so it climbs up the food chain every step. Men have no way in their bodies to get rid of dioxins, but women have two ways. They're both involving having a baby. One is that dioxin crosses the placenta into the growing infant, and the other is that it comes out from the breast milk. So if you have a meat and dairy consuming mother breastfeeding that infant, then the highest impacts of toxic exposure like mercury and dioxins will go to that infant. Pregnant women are told, oh, certain types of fish should be avoided. But what about all these other animal products which are introducing, imagine as the fetus is developing, introducing these very harmful toxins which create reproductive abnormalities, developmental problems and hormonal issues, right as the child is developing, the most critical stage of development. It does make you worry when people say, don't you want to have a little bit of milk because you're pregnant? Don't you want to have some fish because you're pregnant? Who do you think is going to get the chemicals that are in that? All these environmental toxins and toxins from the feed that they're being fed accumulate in their tissues and are released into the mother and unfortunately to the child when you eat these products when you're pregnant. So this includes antibiotics, 
hormones, steroids in animal feed. Commercial animals are largely fed GMO corn and soy, which are very laden in pesticides. PCBs have been banned since the 70s, but they persist in the environment. Dioxins, all of these compounds can create hormonal, reproductive, developmental damage as well. Eating organic beef, poultry, pork, or fish will not help you avoid contaminants like mercury, like dioxins, like strontium-90, because they fall out over all sorts of farm fields and water bodies, and they don't skip over the organic fields. And so really the contaminants are coming in regardless of how these animals are raised. I had always been concerned about the possible health impacts of GMOs, but then found out that most of the world's GMO crops are actually consumed by livestock, with dairy cows consuming the most per animal. This fact, with everything I'd learned about bioaccumulation, made dairy terrifying, especially considering how much cheese I ate in my life. Cheese is an amazing product when you think about it. It's probably one of the single best foods at compromising health that you're going to actually feed to people. Think about it. You've got an animal product, so you've got all the issues of biological concentration. You have a highly processed food product, and not only does it have naturally a lot of saturated fat, but you put a lot of salt into it. There's a strong link between dairy foods and autoimmune diseases, and so that can show itself up as excessive production of mucus and exacerbation of asthma in kids who are prone to that, and even adults. And also there's an association between dairy foods and multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, and other uh, rheumatologic problems. Cow's milk is baby calf growth food. That's what the stuff is. There's absolutely no child or human on Earth who actually needs the milk of a cow any more than they need the milk of a giraffe or a mouse. Most people in the world are lactose intolerant. I mean, that's the normal state of affairs. Why would your body create this enzyme to digest lactose after weaning, after infancy? It doesn't make any sense. 73% of African Americans are lactose intolerant, 95% uh, of Asians, uh, roughly 70% of Native Americans and about 53% of uh, Hispanic Americans are lactose intolerant. Our government is encouraging Americans of color to eat foods that it knows is going to make them ill. Ultimately, what that boils down to is the government is telling me as an African American to eat food that's gonna make me ill for no health benefit so that it will benefit uh, dairy farmers as a form of institutionalized racism. Yeah, milk is a risky a food for human consumption as a pediatrician. I see on a daily basis children suffering uh, from conditions that are linked or associated to dairy consumption, such as eczema, acne, constipation, acid reflux, uh, iron deficiency, anemia. Cow's milk protein is the most allergenic food. People say, well, no, I want hormone-free, not injected with bovine growth hormone. But milk is this hormonal fluid, so it's just packed with sex hormones and natural sex steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone. In fact, doesn't matter if it's conventional milk, doesn't matter if it's organic milk. Milk without hormones, that's an oxymoron. Organic dairy has just as much saturated fat and cholesterol and galactose and all the things that you don't want as conventional dairy. Dairy products in general have a lot of other products associated with it, not the least of which is pus. I mean, they actually have laws limiting how much pus you can actually have in a milk and still sell it. I believe it's like 750,000 pus cells per cc. Because, I mean, you wouldn't want too much pus and it'd be like pure pus, people might object. In fact, you could think of cheese as kind of coagulated cow pus, if you would. But I was always told that we need milk for strong bones. I'm Jane Chapman, and not too long ago, finally got some x-rays of the hips and back. Severe, bilateral, osteoarthritis of the hips. And actually, I'm scheduled for two hip replacements. That's bone on bone. It's the grinding of the joints. My stability is scary. I hold on to the walls if I'm at home. I've been told to use a walker. I'm only 61. This is not how you're supposed to live when you're this old. I have a really hard time believing that um, that's all that's left. Researchers have studied bone development in kids and whether they get stress fractures and that kind of thing. And the kids who drink the most milk have zero protection. Milk does not build strong bones. Harvard researchers have looked at a large group of older women. Over an 18-year period, the milk drinkers had zero protection from fractures. So this old notion that somehow milk is going to build strong bones or protect your bones later in life, it's a myth. People that drink milk have higher rates of hip fractures, have more cancer, 
and live shorter lives. Turns out that countries with the highest dairy consumption